So that video that we looked at yesterday was fairly thick at points. I wanted to clarify some of these things because I think as a computer scientist, you guys need to know how RSA encryption works. Especially given you know, the latest uh, security hack that happened to Google. Actually, it didn't happen lately. It actually happened in 2014. I don't know why right now they're announcing it. I think the reason they're announcing it now is because it, the information surfaced that somebody's trying to sell all of the hacked account information from Yahoo. Uh, and that's why they're making those alerts. But it was like 500 um, million accounts were hacked from Yahoo and all this information. Uh, so I don't know how they hacked it. I'd be interested to find out. I don't know if it was based on RSA encryption or if they found some other way in. Usually this is inside information. You know, somebody downloads something from a server. So it's probably not the RSA encryption that was the problem because that's that would be really difficult to do 500 million times because it's each person gets their own private key. So let's take a look at that. There's some basic terminology here. Uh, Alice wants to send a secret message to Bob. Eve was the eavesdropper. Cryptographers tell Alice that Bob, Alice and Bob, how to encode their message. Cryptoanalysis helps Eve break the code. Uh, there's a historical battle between cryptographers and cryptoanalysis that continues today. So you guys might have seen the movie about the Enigma device and um, Alan Turing and his work. And I mean, that was a pretty big movie that came out. It was a really good movie. Didn't quite end the way uh, reality actually happened. It was a little different, but you know, it was still a really good movie. There was another uh, whole side to that where this continued on and they broke the submarine code and then later they broke the Japanese code by a guy who didn't even speak Japanese. Uh, yeah, Alan Turing didn't speak German either. So the, the two big major code breakings during war were done by or helped by at least people who didn't speak the language that the code was in. So it kind of gives you a perspective about some of these uh, codings, how they're made. But uh, it was proposed by Diffie, Elman, and Merkel. That was the first idea. It was to use a function that cannot be reversed, a Humpty Dumpty function. You know, once you drop the egg, it breaks. You can't reverse it. Bob tells Alice the function to apply a public key, and Eve can't compute the inverse. So that's that idea of modular arithmetic. You see, if I tell you 300 hours have gone by, and I tell you to mod that base 12, it'll tell you the time it will be in 300 hours. But if I tell you the time right now, you can't distinguish the time right now from what it was yesterday from what it was the day before. At, at 11 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday and at 11 o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday, there's no real difference in time. You can't tell the difference, at least in terms of the clock, between an 11 o'clock on a Tuesday and an 11 o'clock on a Wednesday. So the modular arithmetic kind of hides the total amount of time that has passed. All you get is, what's the current time now? So that's the part that makes this the secret. That's the part that gets put in there, because modular arithmetic is really difficult to do an inverse of. The second big idea is to use an asymmetric key. The sender and receiver use different keys. So there's an encryption key and a decryption key. They're separate keys. You're not using the same key. Uh, to encrypt and decrypt. That was one of the issues with the Enigma device is that they used the same encryption decryption key. It was exactly the same. Once they figured out what the key was, they could decode any message. Now, the, with the Enigma device, they changed the key every day. And it was, there was a book that listed the keys for the day, and you would have to use that key for the day. But then they made you know, a really simple mistake. Uh, every morning, they would give out the weather report. And that would be broadcasted in code, the weather report. And at the end of the weather report, they would say, Hail Hitler. At the end of every weather report. So they knew at a certain time every day, they had a set phrase that they knew what it meant. 
and they were able to use that to help them break the code. That was actually what allowed them to speed up the process and break the code before the code was changed the next day. We should. We should. So RSA encryption is named for Ron Rivas, uh, Ada Shamar, and Leonard Edelman. That's where RSA encryption gets its name from. It's from the three people that worked on it. It was invented in 1977. It is still the premier approach. It is based on Fermat's little theorem. <whistles> that thing. <laughs> Those who really love math, feel free to dive in. But uh, it has a slight variation. P minus 1 times Q minus 1. This is our keys right here. Our encryption and decryption keys working together in a modulus. And it's based upon prime numbers. P and Q. And this is the big part. It requires a large prime, usually 100 digits. In fact, if it's not more than 50 digits, we can't really represent all of the letters. It has to be at least 50 in order to represent the letters. So essentially, here's how it works. You pick two prime numbers, P and Q. You compute an N, which is a product of P and Q. Then you pick two e numbers, E and D, such that E times D equals P minus 1 times Q minus 1 times K plus 1 for some random K. It's not quite random. There's a reason why we picked that K. You publish N and E, which is the public key. You encode the original message with E mod N. But then you keep D, P, and Q secret, the private key, and you decode the encoded message by doing encoded message to the D mod N. So you encrypt by raising the original message to the power of E. You decrypt by raising the encoded message to the power of D. And that's pretty cool. It's just a math function that you're doing on a computer to encode and decode. It's really fast. So how does it work? Here's some of the, ma the math behind this. I'm not going to dive into this tremendously, but if you're really interested in it, it's, it's very interesting to get into. Uh, you have a message. If you raise that message to the ED, you get message ED, right? Does that make sense? So if you remember how we picked E and D, we know that E is P minus 1 times Q minus 1 times K plus 1. That's the product of ED. That's how we picked it. If we apply some little bit of algebra here and multiply uh, and break this up, right? When we're raising a power to an exponent, we can actually break up the same base. We can break up these powers. And so we have P minus 1 to the Q minus 1 to the K times K times message 1 plus 1 because we're adding exponents here. Then we apply Fermat's little theorem, okay, which says we can uh, break this up and get message ED is 1 to the K times message 1, which ends up giving us the message. I know, got all that? Absolutely, perfectly, fantastic, okay. <laughs> like I said, if you want to dive more into the map, I'm more than happy to sit with you and go through it. Point is just kind of go through this. So will it stop working if computers get fast enough? The answer is yes, it will. <laughs> if computers get fast enough, this is not going to work. Right now, the standard method for exchanging cryptology keys uh, RSA 1024 is in jeopardy. Once commonly used to exchange keys between browsers and web servers, it more than likely has been broken. So there is a computer out there that can break the common RSA encryption that we use on the internet. However, the cost of that computer to build means that they're not going to be used to break the encryption of your Amazon purchase. This computer is probably being used to attack government facilities, large corporations, and things like that. At this point, those people don't use RSA 1024. They use RSA 2048, which is still approved by the NSA, or um, the NIST. I thought I had a link, a link there to that. So just to kind of give you some, an example of this in effect. 
there's this RSA calculator that you can actually go ahead and experiment with. But the trick is you got to pick the right numbers. So there's this little website that does it for me. You pick two prime numbers, let's say 23 and 71. Check to make sure they're prime. Now, we would pick two prime numbers when we did this for real that were like 100 digits, like big prime numbers. Then we calculate n, which is a product of p times q. Calculate this, which is 1540. The candidates for 1 mod r have to be um, what they call uh, prime to each other. So that's a process. We have to pick some numbers that are prime to each other. Then you pick one of those. That's your k. Find a number equal to 1 mod r, which can be factored. Enter k. Prime factors of k. So it's a process to pick this out, to make this work. This is all done behind the scenes by a computer every time you make a purchase. Every single time. When the little lock goes closed on your browser, you know that you are using RSA encryption to send the information back and forth. Then they use a ASCII character code to type in your code and you encrypt and decrypt it back and forth once you get your message. Once you have your, prime, your private key, it's all set up. A lot of times, if it's a closed system, they'll just find the primary key once. I know GitHub, do, GitHub does that. If you're pushing information up from your computer to GitHub, there's a process where you develop these keys and you lock it down using that method. So here's the factoring problem worth $200,000. This is RSA 2048. It has 617 decimal digits, 2,048 bits. If you can factor that size number, it's worth $200,000. So they're looking for numbers that are prime that fit this qualification that are 617 digits. And they will pay you for those numbers. Those numbers are not easy to find. You know, 71, that's an easy prime number, right? Give me a prime number over 300. Come on, off the top of your head. That's not so easy to do. And they were only talking three digits. Give me a prime number that's 617 digits off the top of your head. Come on. And then prove to me that it's prime. That's challenging. That's why they have awards for these types of things. So you could make a good living if you were really good at prime numbers. You know, just kind of cranking them out. <laughs> $200,000 a pop. I think that'd be pretty good. Hey, math, math majors, there you go. There's your life right there. Cranking out prime numbers. Maybe do one every couple months. $200,000 a pop. I think that's fantastic. Right? I can't do it. <laughs> Where's Rain Man when we need him, right? You guys ever see that movie? Guy could just like come up with stuff like that. I think there's been a couple movies like that. So uh, that's essentially it for RSA encryption. But I do have a whole bunch of other resources that are just kind of stuck in a folder down here. Let me just turn this off. So it's in the module. 3 math lesson 1. There's this whole folder called RSA. And in here, there's like a challenge to encode a message to me. There's uh, RSA encryption concept examples, RSA code made easy, a key generator, how to calculate D, another calculator. So, like the current RSA numbers and an RSA calculator. This is always fun. These are current. Um, large primes that people use to do keys. The RSA Laboratories published a number of set semi-primes with 100 to 617 decimal digits. And they have cash prizes. So this is where you guys go to collect RSA Laboratories for RSA Security LLC. Go there if you want to collect your $200,000. By the way, at that point, I would not be surprised if you did it more than once if there were these black SUVs 
sitting in front of your house. <laughs> All of a sudden, you become a very important person. Just so you know. Okay, so. Okay, so at the end of this, you have your exit ticket, which I want you guys to work on. And then there's also this modular code practice where you have to go through and do some calculations, input a three-digit integer, print out the digits, one per line. So three, print out these digits. Think about how to do that with modular math. How would you print out the individual digits? Not using integer division. I want you to do it using modular math. So just because you get the result on the screen does not mean that you did it the way I want you to do it. So it's important that you do modular math. Uh, I saw that on some of the other quizzes that people had submitted. Uh, one of the, It wasn't a quiz, I think it was one of the practices where they did, they locked it into a particular number when they were getting the first two digits. And I think I wrote feedback for a lot of you, like what if, the, the idea is to make it general so anybody can type in a number and make it give you those first two digits, where some of you had hard-coded to be like 45. You know, it was, it's locked in to only work with 45 point something. So I want you thinking about that when you're doing this. It should be a readint and allow anybody to enter in 678 uh, or any number that they want, and then print out the three digits. Notice they are in ones, tens, hundreds order. You only have to do three digits, okay? You, later on, we could talk about how to make it as many digits as they type in. But I don't want you to do it with integer division. I want you to do it with modular math. So you really need to sit down and think about that. And then check that the last problem, so um, change the last problem so that it print, also prints the sum of the digits. So I want you to print out what the sum is. And then what would you have to change if I told you to input a four-digit number? And how about a seven-digit number? So you know that you don't actually have to write the code for, the four-digit and the seven-digit. You would just kind of talk about in general terms how you would expand this out to a bigger problem. So that's the practice assignment. So go ahead, work on the exit ticket first. After you have the exit ticket, do, uh, work on the modular code practice.